So we have a multimedia presentation today. Yay. Uh, so one medium is the usual, me on the blackboard. Then um, there's also video of two demonstrations that um, show some real nonlinear phenomena connected to what we're talking about, which are hop bifurcations. Um, and then I also want to show you some computer simulations, which I haven't dared to do before, but with any luck, that will work also. Hi there, Colin. How's it going? OK. OK, so let's begin. Um, people coming late can hand in homework at the end of the hour. I also have some tests that need to be picked up. So um, let's do that when we're done. All right. So our first topic is what are known as super, sorry, we talked about supercritical hop bifurcations. I want to try to distinguish them now from subcritical. And so I think it's sort of unfortunate nomenclature. You might think just from the word sub versus supercritical, it almost sounds like the same thing. And you might not really have a strong intuitive feeling for how different they are. And I'm hoping that by the end of this lecture, you will see that they are really dramatically different with big implications for engineering and science. So uh, let us say that a, in a subcritical hop, we have an unstable cycle. that surrounds a stable spiral. So you might have a diagram that looks something like this. Here's the unstable limit cycle, shown dotted because it's unstable. And then a um, stable spiral point here in the middle trajectory spiraling into that. And also, since this is an unstable cycle, they're spiraling away from the cycle. All right, so we have that. Then the, the transition is that as we change some parameter, this uh, dotted limit cycle gets smaller and smaller. And it starts to choke this point like a sort of a noose going around the neck of this point, And it's going to constrict on this point until we get a picture that um, you know looks like, think about it from the point of view of this spiraling trajectory here that's going away. That can, will continue to be spiraling away. But it's now surrounding this very tiny cycle, which might just look like a big dot to you. But that's, that's a shrunken version of the cycle that is still surrounding a stable point inside. So right at the bifurcation, the cycle has shrunk to a point. And so after that, what we'll have is um, just an unstable spiral with no more limit cycle. And also, you can, I mean, if we go in the opposite direction, it's um, also called a subcritical hop. That is, you can start over here and have an unstable spiral, then change a parameter, and a tiny unstable cycle pops out around it, which then grows to become that one. That's also considered subcritical. The directionality doesn't matter. It's the, the fact that the cycle is unstable when it's born that gives it the name subcritical. So if we were to draw a picture, say, in a, um, well, maybe I should clarify here that the cycle shrinks as we go that direction. Now, uh, if we think in terms of the amplitude of the oscillation, the 
amplitude of the oscillation that corresponds to this cycle. The, the picture would look something like this. If we think of a control parameter A, then um, and we'll use the letter R for the amplitude of the oscillation, sort of like a radial, a measure of the radial extent of the oscillation in the phase plane. Then you would see over here we have this large but unstable oscillation, which then shrinks to zero. Down here we also have this stable fixed point. So I'm drawing with a big heavy solid line that corresponds to this stable point existing. But then at the subcritical hop occurring right here, um, those two collide at zero radius, leaving us with only this unstable spiral, which is sort of a zero amplitude object. So that's what the bifurcation diagram would look like as compared to, say, a supercritical hop. would have a bifurcation diagram that looks like this. We still have um, a stable point down here. And then it goes unstable as we change our control parameter. But the difference is that now the cycle lives on this side, and it's stable. So that was the, the picture that we discussed in the last lecture, where um, we had a, um, a stable fixed point that then gives rise to a small stable limit cycle. That's this. Small when it's born. OK, so now if you're having trouble following that, or that is you don't really get the distinction why it's such a big deal, I hope that um, I can clarify it right now with some stories and then with this video that I want to show. Do you want to ask anything at this stage? OK. So what's the, what's the big deal? I mean, I, here's what I want you to get from this. That when we speak about subcritical, it might help to know that in other cultures or also in other parts of bifurcation theory or other disciplines, people use different words. They, they sometimes refer to this bifurcation. Actually, the, the supercritical case is sometimes called soft or continuous. or even safe, whereas this is hard. I mean, you can guess where I'm going with this. Discontinuous or, naturally, dangerous. Now, um, that's starting to sound different, right? Dangerous versus safe. What is so dangerous about this case? Well, imagine um, we think about it from the point of view of a control engineer. Uh, like, suppose that we're talking about the vibration of an airplane wing. And we don't want it to vibrate too much because it will fall off the plane and the plane will crash. And that's dangerous. OK. So from the point of view of the amplitude of the vibration, here, there's no amplitude. There's, we're at a stable equilibrium, so there's no vibration of the wing. And then when we get to this point, well, a, a bifurcation occurs. And now we're looking around for some attractor to go to, except we don't see any. Right? That's dangerous. <laughs> because the system, which used to be at zero amplitude, is now going to jump, except to what? There's nothing nearby that's attracting. In contrast here, if we have something at you know, no amplitude of vibration, if we go past the transition, well, OK, so we're oscillating this much. But like I said in the previous lecture, that's sort of like my dad's arm tremoring that much instead of not tremoring at all. It's not great, but it's not as bad as if his arm is going like this. right? I mean, that's what you should sort of picture when you have a subcritical hop, that you lose stability to something unforeseeable and potentially catastrophic. So um, that's the distinction. That's what makes that one more sort of discontinuous or dangerous. So as an example of it, if we were to write in polar coordinates something like this, um, r dot is ar 
plus sine r cubed minus r to the fifth. The difference being that with a subcritical, we have a plus sign here. If this were a minus, that would be a supercritical case. It would look like the one we discussed in the previous lecture. But, but with this plus sign, we have something nasty. Um, nothing of great importance happens in the theta direction. Let's just say theta dot is 1. Yeah, I mean, we're just going to go around in theta. But, but so what you would see for the different phase portraits here, you can check that um, just by looking at this one-dimensional system in the radial direction, that if A is less than 0 but greater than negative a quarter, so you'll have to work out a little bit of the details to see why that comes in, um, then, in that regime, what we have is a stable fixed point. So we're sort of over here in the picture. We have a stable fixed point surrounded by a, um, an unstable cycle, perfectly circular in our contrived little example here. Theta dot is 1, so we're going around it in this direction. And... Um, you know, we would spiral into this point. But what happens if we're outside? Well, we go out, but it turns out that there is another cycle. We actually have two cycles in the same picture. You can check that, by the way, if you want to just give you a little preview. You could factor out an R. Then you have an A plus R squared minus R to the fourth. And so... By thinking about this expression, which is quadratic in the quantity r squared, you can just use the quadratic equation to calculate that there can be um, another state with r equals constant, and it's going to be a bigger stable limit cycle sitting out here. So in fact, this will spiral out and approach this stable limit cycle like so. So here you have a coexistence of both a stable cycle at large amplitude of oscillation and also a stable point down here with no oscillation at all, no amplitude. So there are two different attractors in the same problem. Um, if we change A to get closer to zero, well, actually, what would happen if we go past A equals zero? So let's, I mean, the bifurcation is at A equals zero where, as I said before, the, the limit cycle sh that's unstable shrinks, tightens around this point, and then hits that point at A equals 0. I won't draw that picture. But, but when A is greater than 0, what you're left with is this big stable limit cycle that's kind of like hanging around as a bystander while all the action is happening with the choking of this point by that unstable um, limit cycle. And so it has now gone unstable leading to this kind of thing. So from the point of view of what used to be a stable equilibrium, after you cross the transition at A equals 0, you suddenly have this huge flapping, you know, this huge limit cycle. You've jumped to a different attractor far away. So to sort of fill in the picture, in this example it would look, I mean, this question mark can be answered for this picture because we have the details. Um, the bifurcation diagram, you can check, uh, will look like this. That the, the amplitude as a function of the control parameter A, well, you'll have a stable fixed point until A equals zero. Then there's the unstable limit cycle that is... Sometimes, by the way, people call this a backward bifurcation for the reason that it looks like this limit cycle is bending backwards relative to the control parameter A's increase. Anyway, it bends backwards. Then something else happens that I don't want to discuss now at negative a quarter, which is we gave a hint of it in the last lecture, that there's another bifurcation that can happen in this problem, which is that the two cycles can collide, right? The stable cycle can merge with the unstable cycle. That occurs at negative a quarter in this other kind of bifurcation, the saddle node coalescence of two cycles. 
So we'll discuss that later, but, but for now, anyway, that happens here at negative a quarter, leading then to this large amplitude stable cycle like so. And so what you can get in this system is as you increase A, here you are at stable equilibrium, you come to this point and then ah, you jump all the way up to here. Right? It's a discontinuous transition. And as you continue increasing the parameter, now you're up here on this big amplitude cycle, which if you decide, well, I don't like that, I want to go home, um, okay, you can turn around, but you will not jump back. You have to go all the way to here before you jump back to equilibrium. So this is an example of hysteresis, but now occurring at the level of cycles rather than fixed points like we saw earlier in the course. So is there any question about the big deal at a subcritical transition? Um, okay. Uh, let me just mention one other thing and then show you the movies of this. So one thing to keep in mind is that you cannot use linearization to tell the difference. You, you want to know when the system has sub versus supercritical, but you can't use linear arguments to see it. That should be apparent actually just from this picture. Suppose you were a bug here moving along this axis. You know, what's the difference where, where like you can only see a little bit in the vertical direction? These pictures look the same. Something stable that then becomes dashed. Stable becomes dashed. Locally, they don't really look very different. The, the big difference is the position of this branch of cycles and, and also its stability. So, or as I mentioned earlier, it has to do with this cubic term. It's this term, the sign of the R cubed, that controls things. And that's a nonlinear phenomenon, right? That's not picked up by the linearization. If you have a plus sign here, it's going to be uh, that as you increase the amplitude, the R cubed helps you and makes the amplitude go even larger. That is, there's an explosive instability because of the plus R cubed, whereas here the R cubed is fighting against the unstable linear part. So you cannot actually use linearization to distinguish. distinguish sub versus supercritical. Hop. So if in a given problem you're asked, well, which kind of bifurcation is it? You have a hop, which one is it? And I hope you, know, you now appreciate what a big difference it is. What do you do? Well, um, there is an analytical criterion to tell the difference. But think about it. I mean, what that criterion has to do is basically tell you the sign of that cubic term. And that means that the calculation required goes beyond linearization. It, it involves thinking carefully about somehow calculating the, the normal form, which is a topic we haven't discussed really in this course, just we mention it, but we don't really say what it is. So I think I want to postpone that till another course. It's pretty hairy. That is, the calculation of that cubic term is, is involved. Um, so I'm going to say it exists, but it's complicated. And if you're interested in it, uh, a good reference would be the book by Guggenheimer and Holmes. Where they derive the criterion and discuss you know, what it is. That's in section 3.4 of their book. Or if you're really dying to see what it is, then um, there is an exercise in, in my textbook. So that's, um, so you could see the exercise 
point 12 where I just write down the condition without deriving it and give you some practice using it. So, but it has a lot of terms in it. It won't be obvious where it comes from. Instead, I, I think for our course, the approach I want to take is to just use a computer. The computer will tell you if it's sub or super critical, and that's often good enough. Uh, though it's not a proof, whereas these will give proofs. Okay, so let me leave it at that for now and, and let me show you some uh, demonstrations of these and try to build up your intuition by asking you which one is this, which one is that, as you watch them happen in real systems. Do you want to ask any questions before I go to the video? Yes? The question is, is the graph on the left supposed to represent the bifurcation diagram for the subcritical case? Yes. Right. This is the picture for the subcritical hop. That's the bifurcation diagram. And the, and the subcritical hop is happening right here at this point. Whereas the supercritical hop is happening right here. Uh, yes? So the question is, linearization amounts to just taking the first leading terms in the Taylor expansion. And if we're worried about higher order terms, why don't we just keep them in the Taylor expansion? Yes, that's right. That's the idea. You, you will keep them. And um, when you do a normal form calculation, you keep those terms, and then you massage them by making certain changes of coordinates to try to get rid of as many nonlinear terms as you can because it's complicated if you have a lot of them around. So you try to eliminate some by clever changes of variables. And you can, except some you cannot. And the ones you cannot are the ones that are there that are controlling things, the cubic term in the radial direction. That's the whole point of normal form theory. You eliminate as much as you can. And what's left is what governs the dynamics. And so that's a systematic way of doing that, normal form theory. And it'll, it'll give you this r cubed term and its sign and a coefficient in front of it. And, and actually down here, what you'll find is that you'll get an omega, which I hear I've made up to be 1. And then there will typically be another term that's like that, which you can't get rid of, which will control um, how the frequency depends on amplitude. So yes, that's, that's all worked out. Um, but it's not just a matter of keep all the terms in the Taylor series, because it's too hard to see what's going on if you do that. You want to get rid of as many as you can. Is there another question? Yes? I think you said that it doesn't matter which way you go with A. So like, can you, like, um, like the subcritical case, can you, like, just adopt A and then change the solid line of the like, adopt A and then, like, as you increase A, Good. Thank you for this question. This is a very good question, because this is one of the most confusing things about the whole topic, is this terminological question. If I, if I get your question, it's, a, it's that, look at this picture. It looks like the dotted line exists, so to speak, below the transition. That is, at lower values of A. And that suggests why we are calling it subcritical, because it exists below the critical point. And so if I hear you right, your question is, suppose the picture looked like this. Would that be considered subcritical? So what do people think? Yes, because the principle is it doesn't have anything to do with the direction, despite the dumb name. It only has to do with, is the bifurcating object stable or not? That's the way to remember it. Here, the bifurcating object, that is off the straight, simple solution. The bifurcating thing is unstable. So we call the bifurcation subcritical, even though it looks like it's occurring at a high, I mean, it is occurring at a higher value of the parameter. Why, why do we have this terminology? Why are we stuck with it? It's because of fluid dynamics. The people who do fluid dynamics always think about a control parameter like a Reynolds number or a Rayleigh number, or something that measures how fast the flow is or 
how strong a temperature gradient is that's driving convection, whatever. So in that subject, it tends to be that as you increase the parameter, um, you drive the system into some bifurcation. And so they got in the habit of saying, you know, when they see this, they think of it as subcritical because it's below a critical Reynolds number. But it really can also apply to a picture like this. This is, this is also called subcritical, even though it doesn't look like it should be. So that's the thing to keep in mind. Subcritical means the bifurcating object is unstable, and therefore, this is a very dangerous bifurcation. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, it's easy to understand that something would be calm and stable at some low value of a control parameter and then get increasingly you know, prone to instability of some kind. But what seems pretty strange is how could you imagine a situation where a system is, is unstable and then as you increase a parameter it quiets down and then becomes stable? Is that sort of the question? Um, well, uh, you're right that this doesn't tend to occur as much in practice, and that, that's partly where the terminology came from. But it's allowed to, and you will encounter cases like this. I don't know. Um, I mean, I think, you, sorry, did someone have a suggestion? Yeah, right. If you think of this as a damping parameter, you could imagine that a system is badly behaved until you make sufficient damping, and then it quiets it down or something. That I, I don't want to be too concrete, but I think we will run into pictures where you might see something like that. But it is less common than the top. All right, so anyway, those are the words. Now, what I want to do next is show you a couple of videos, which are, um, OK, so let me first apologize for their quality. They are ho totally amateur hour home videos um, that I made amazingly 20 years ago. Wow, think about that. So uh, 20 years ago, I was teaching at MIT. And um, I had various colleagues in the Boston area who I had come to know and who had really interesting phenomena, nonlinear things in their labs that I thought, uh, I knew I was moving to Cornell, and I thought, I don't want to sacrifice these wonderful demonstrations. Can I make a movie of these things so I could show them forever after? So you know, I went with a friend of mine with a video camera and I got a scientist to talk about what their system was doing. And we just made movies you know, in the clumsiest, crudest way. You will, so that's what you'll see. The, the first one is me talking to a, uh, an expert in aerodynamics named John DeGunji, who um, was relatively old at the time that we made the movie. I'm not even sure if he's still alive today. But anyway, so he'll show you a couple of different things about um, model airfoils. Some represent turbine blades. Some represent wings of airplanes. Um, he has a, a, a setup where he has a kind of a wind tunnel, but really what it looks like to me when I went there, I'm not an aero guy, is um, he has a vacuum cleaner running in reverse. So it's blowing air instead of sucking air, and it makes a lot of noise. You know, you'll, see, you'll hear, it's annoying. It's really making this loud noise. And then as he changes the control parameter, it's not just moving a variable on a picture like we do in math. He's actually turning a knob on this vacuum cleaner and makes it louder. <laughs> and he's got this old man voice, so it's sort of hard to hear him over the vacuum cleaner as he's explaining what's going on. Anyway, so that'll be the first video, and then I'll talk about the second one when it's time. Rex? Yeah, OK. Let me first show the first one. And no making jokes about how much more hair I used to have. <laughs> that might, may happen to some of you, too. All right, here we go. So let's see. Um, I have to get the room set up. So get out your popcorn.
right. So here is John de Gungy and yours truly. Goes on for 10 minutes, wow. And I'm gonna be stopping it at various points to um, ask you questions to see if you're getting what's happening. They're in the left half plane. Are they on the real axis? They have imaginary parts because it's oscillatory damping. Otherwise, it would be exponential damping, right? So it's, jig it's ringing as it damps out. So picture a pair of complex conjugate eigenvalues in the left half plane. Then he turned on some wind. He said it takes longer to damp out. What does that mean? What happened to the eigenvalues? They're shifting closer to the imaginary axis because the difference, the distance from the imaginary axis controls the decay rate, right? The closer you are, the real part of the eigenvalue is the rate of exponential damping. So if it takes longer to damp, it means you're closer to the imaginary axis. So we got our picture that we're approaching a Hopf bifurcation. Imaginary, sort of complex conjugate eigenvalues are moving towards the imaginary axis as he turns up the wind. So what have we just seen? What would it mean if a small disturbance dies out? That, that point is still stable. 
Right? So we have, a, we have a stable equilibrium point, stable to infinitesimal disturbances. However, finite size disturbances, big enough disturbances, cause it to go to another attractor, a large amplitude limit cycle. So can you picture in your phase plane mind what you just saw? Yes? Right, there's an unstable cycle surrounding the equilibrium point, itself surrounded by a bigger stable cycle. So if your perturbation doesn't take you across the dashed line, you'll damp back out to the stable point. If the perturbation takes you across the dashed limit cycle, now you go out to a big limit cycle. So those pictures I'm drawing are real. This is really happening. The model just goes by itself. The model, he doesn't mean mathematical model, he means his mechanical model. That um, this system now just oscillates no matter what. He can't keep it stable. Why not? He's, he's past a critical point where now what used to be a stable point is now choked off and gone. So in fact, the first thing that happened was not a Hopf bifurcation. The first thing that happened was the creation of this large amplitude cycle. Uh, and then the second thing that happened was that the unstable cycle that was born in the process choked off the stable point. So now we just have the big limit cycle. I don't, I wouldn't know. I don't really know what the dynamics of this system are in great detail. It's pretty rich. Uh, yeah, no, it's an interesting question. Okay. Now, we can try doing this at plus or minus, plus five degrees. I'll set it so that initially there's a current going to the wind. So what he has here, but you can't see it, is behind the wooden board where the, the wing is, He's got some kind of apparatus on the back that controls a spring that has to, he's talking about the angle of attack of the wing. You can see the wing is tilted. Um, so he's changed it so that instead of being level, in equilibrium, the wing now wants to be tilted. And up changing the dynamics a lot. As you and uh, I'll bring up the speed again. Pressures at the corner, at the corner of the core, there's a pivot around the 
could be the center of the so we will go up to some slightly new position here. And it is still stable here. If we get it up to uh, a speed of about six, six, 17, uh, right about here, you see that we get this into a, a low amplitude limit zone. The airfoil is just going in and out of the stall. The stall so in, in aerodynamics language, the airfoil is going in and out of the stall. It's a low amplitude limit cycle. You know what you're seeing. Right? Oh, is around, uh, around uh, 12, 10, 12 degrees. And uh, the load was initially at 5 degrees. The wind had brought it up to right about the stall point of about 10, 11 degrees. Statically. And now it's going in and out to a small amplitude limit cycle. Over if I give it a bigger shape, also at this point it will catch a larger limit cycle. Uh, this is about plus or minus 70 degrees. If I stop down, it will go into that small one. So this is one of these the cases where a true limit cycle is possible for this uh, this uh, is pretty interesting that he um, he has two different stable limit cycles in the same system on a big one right he could get it either small or big we haven't seen a phase portrait like that okay uh, now uh, we have here we have another model of uh, elastic instability this is more like one of the wing movies say about three quarters of the way out of the wing, that the wing would be able to bend up and down like that because of the flexibility of the wing. And it also would be able to twist these uh, around the axis. So in a sense, that wing section, which is typical of the whole wing, would be have a bending degree of freedom and a torsion degree of freedom. It's two degrees of freedom. And uh, this would be uh, typical of the uh, aircraft wing. The other one is coming around the middle is more typical of a turbine. So getting back to this, uh, there's a little exception, but if you get an idea about the motion of this, it bends up. Let's try putting some wind on this thing.
violence and rough movement of the heroes alone. This light paragraph is in a severe tail flutter condition as photographed by a chase airplane. Fortunately, this was a modified airplane and is not a production model. <laughs> That's some priceless footage from uh, NASA, and uh, I love the, the style of the commentary. Yes, classical aileron flutter. Anyway, if you want to watch those again, um, they're on YouTube, as is this next one, which I want to, let's see, let me put the lights back on for a second to tell you a story. So the, the next sequence... Do you want to ask anything before we leave the um, aeroelastic instabilities? Yes? Mm. The question was that when we um, change the static angle of attack from zero degrees to five degrees, the system went from having a sub to supercritical hop. Uh, what would that mean in terms of the geometry of the phase portraits? I don't want to try to describe it in words or and spend time on it, but that's a very good question. The system has changed its character from sub to supercritical. So there is a kind of transition between those two that people call tricritical, um, where that cubic term, the sign of the cubic term is going through zero, right? You've gone from plus to minus. So then now the fifth power term is going to be the dominant, the art of the fifth term. Um, it's an interesting, more complicated phenomenon than we've talked about. But I, I guess I'll leave it to you to think about it. It's, it's a good question. Yes? The question was, what was the flutter on those actual airplanes? Were those sub or supercritical? I don't know. I, I don't know. We just this was just some footage that Professor Degunji had around, and I, I don't really know much about it. But um, there is good theoretical understanding of aeroelastic flutter, so the models might tell you which type. And you know, just to reiterate, as the commentator said, the narrator, these are specially designed production. Mo this is not what you're going to see when you look out the window next time you fly somewhere. We hope. <laughs> That is, planes are not supposed to do this, but um, sometimes for experimental reasons we test them outside their normal regime of operation where they can do strange things like that. Anyway, the next sequence has to do with chemical oscillations. And um, this was filmed at Brandeis with Irv Epstein, who is a chemist who works on dynamics of of chemical reactions that instead of just going to equilibrium the way you expect them to monotonically, um, they can oscillate en route to equilibrium. And there's a little story about that that if you haven't heard, you might find interesting, that uh, in the 1950s, no one knew about such a thing. That is, it was just thought that chemical reactions go to equilibrium. They might change color once or something, and that's it. And from our understanding of the second law of thermodynamics about entropy increasing in a closed system, you think there's not really very much that can happen. So that turned out to be not true, that the story is more complicated, as was revealed by a, um, a biochemist named Boris Belasov, working in the former Soviet Union. He, he was interested in this thing in biochemistry called the Krebs cycle, which you might have once memorized in high school biology. Um, 
And so anyway, he wanted to make a test tube version of the Krebs cycle. And so he mixed in certain chemicals that were known to occur in the Krebs cycle and left out most of the others and started experimenting on it. And to his surprise, he found that it changed color periodically, that it would be yellow, then it would be clear, then it would be yellow. And it was going on like this for many, many minutes, changing colors, um, which totally shocked him. No one had ever heard of such a thing. And he described his work carefully and tried to publish it, but it kept getting rejected because the referee said, this is obvious nonsense. This is like a perpetual motion machine, except in chemistry. And any moron who knows the least bit about thermodynamics knows that this is impossible. So the paper is rejected. And this kept happening to poor, poor Boris Bielasov. He had the experiments. All the referees had to do, but he didn't have video of it. I mean, it's 1950-something. Anyway, um, he did manage to publish it in a fairly obscure uh, like radiological conference or something where nobody really saw it. But some people were aware of it in Moscow. They'd heard about this guy. And one uh, scientist asked his PhD student, why don't you check out this thing that Bielasov has been talking about? See if you can get that to work. And this student, the grad student, was named Jabotinsky. And you may have heard of the now famous bielasov jabotinsky reaction, the BZ reaction, because Jabotinsky tried it and of course it worked. And then they later perfected it um, and made it very vivid with changing colors from blue to orange. Um, so it's now known that chemical reactions can oscillate as they go to equilibrium. They don't typically do it, but you can cook them up so that they do. And uh, so what I want to show you in this next sequence is an example of an oscillating chemical reaction if you've never seen one before. You may have seen them in chemistry labs or their, their favorite demonstrations, but um, if not, you will be amazed, I, I have a feeling. So this is with Irv Epstein at Brandeis. chemistry lab of Perbeckian at Brandeis University. And uh, we're going to see two demonstrations, one about oscillating chemical reactions and another about pattern formation in a chemical system. So, Bert, can you uh, first tell us a little about this reaction that we're going to see uh, in the beaker? Yeah, this, this reaction is known as the Briggs rapture reaction. And it was developed in 1973 by two high school teachers in San Francisco. They were looking for a visually impressive oscillating reaction that was a little easier to run than either uh, the Belsak-Jabotinsky or the Gray reaction, which were the two oscillating reactions that were known at that time. Both of the earlier reactions had been discovered accidentally. So, in a sense, the Brick uh, Rapture reaction, which is a hybrid of the other two reactions, is the first deliberately designed oscillating chemical reaction. So, let me show you how it works. So, I'm going to mix solutions of three chemicals. The first one is potassium ionate.
really has a dramatic transition to blue, but um, slower pace. Yeah, what we'll see in the system is that the amount of time that it spends in the blue state will gradually increase until eventually it will get stuck in the blue state and the creature and man delivered in uh, a true periodic oscillator. Uh, we would have to have an open system and we would have to flow and it's continuously in and out. So this is a closed system, second law of thermodynamics requires that it's come to delivery eventually. And so the period will gradually lengthen, and as I say, eventually it will recover back into the yellow state. What exactly are the two states? Do you have two compacts? Uh, and what accounts are there? Uh, one is essentially an oxidized state, and one is essentially a reduced state. Oh. It's the reoxy reaction. Uh, and so we see periodic uh, release of oxidation and reduction. Our bubbles of oxygen that are produced when the nitrogen peroxide decomposes to oxygen and water, and that reaction provides the thermodynamic driving force for the system. Also, what if we turn up the stir? Well, we can try that. And I think we'll just see more uh, of a spatial effect. That is the the color change uh, will not occur simultaneously all over the, the beaker, but should spread from one or two points to others. Oh, I have any trouble with that. Uh, we, we may have uh, <laughs> let the system get too close to the delivery yeah. before we turn off the All right, if it's going to die eventually. <laughs> What you saw there. All right, I that's discussed in section 8.3 of the book. Um, there's a whole section on oscillating chemical reactions. I I think in the interest of time, I'd like to go right to the computer simulation related to this. I'll um, not really say anything about the chemistry, but just in case some of you haven't been using software to be integrating your differential equations or looking at bifurcations. This, this may give you a little taste of just how easy it is. So let's do that. Uh, I don't know if I need, maybe it's good to keep the room dark. All right, let's see here. So for this purpose, let us go to p-plane. Here, if you search for P plane, the first hit is this site, uh, Java blocked. Whoops. <laughs> uh, all right, what is that going to do for me? I should have checked this ahead of time. Is this really not going to work? I trust you. It's still not going to work. I haven't installed the right thing. So what am I supposed to do? I have to go to settings? Uh, uh, you have to open your Java settings, Java console. I don't know how to do that. Uh, yeah, thank you. All right, let's try this. Uh, thank, thank you. OK. Good. Security. Security. Yeah, there is not. There's no small. It's like the same thing with uh, going to Starbucks. <laughs> oh, I could have made them allowed? Yeah. Really? So now I have to drag in this. Well, let me go back to where I was. 
Okay, add. So that one, whoops. And then we'll say, okay. Yeah, I know. Okay, you think I'll be good now? Where do I do that? Browser. This. Oh, yeah, okay, reload. Yes, I do. Yes, please. Hey, good. Thank you, guys. Very helpful. All right. So let's close all that. Now, of course, my computer will have be swarming with viruses, but okay. <laughs> That's okay. As long as we can run P-Plane, what's the difference? <laughs> yeah, so um, P-Plane is a tool. Thank you. And so here are the, the differential equations. I don't know, have a lot of you used this yet? Put up your hand if you've played with this. All right, so several of you have not. This is handy. What you're going to do is, like here's the differential equation that is a model for a certain oscillating chemical reaction. I'm going to put in my equation for x prime, which is, involves a parameter a, which is not recognized, but that's okay. It will be soon because I can define a parameter here, a, uh, which I'll do later. Anyway, a minus x minus 4xy divided by 1 plus x squared. And then uh, the other equation involves a parameter b times x. Okay, let's define b soon enough. Then b times x, 1 minus y over 1 plus x squared squared, or no, parentheses, yeah. And so reasonable parameters here, the X and Y represent concentrations of chemicals, iodide and chloride, in a certain other chemical reaction that's discussed in that section 8.3. So um, it turns out that for this, let me see, what are some good parameters? Uh, an A of 10 and a B of 2 is reasonable. And let's see what we get if we do that. Graph the phase plane. Actually, it, it had negative values. Now, these are concentrations, so it's probably reasonable to set them to be positive. Zero. And I don't remember, maybe like from four on the x-axis to about maybe 10 or so on the y-axis. Graph the phase plane. All right. So now there are various things you can do with p-plane, like, look at how nice this is. You can, if you want, you can draw the null clines. That's good. You can also ask it questions like, what kind of equilibrium point is this? So how do I do that? I think I go to solution, find an equilibrium point. Click near one. Well, that looks pretty near. And then it tells you right there there's a spiral source, meaning an unstable spiral. It'll tell you what the Jacobian is. It tells you what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. So very handy to have that. And, okay, well, we have this unstable spiral. So um, if I just click on the phase plane, I get uh, a trajectory. It tells me some things about it. A forward orbit, actually it's misspelled, but okay. Forward orbit, a, a possible closed orbit was detected. Yes, but it's very, very cagey. It's not committing. It, I mean, it doesn't know. It knows that it's a computer and it's not sure, but it thinks that there's a closed orbit. And um, it certainly looks like there's a closed orbit there. One thing you can do that's handy sometimes is to change how it integrates, like when you look at the solution direction, rather than going both forward and backward, which is what it's doing at the moment. That is, it's integrating both forward and backward in time. You can ask it to just integrate forward, and um, then, you know, whoops, what happened? Ah, I started here, I went, bam, onto the neighborhood of the null cline, 
and then asymptotically approaching what is actually a stable limit cycle here, um, you know, shown as that closed curve. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is that that closed orbit represents the chemical oscillation that you can observe in real experiments, but also because I want to show you what does a Hopf bifurcation look like in the phase plane. So if I change parameters, um, I can make this elliptical looking limit cycle. Of course, this is really what they look like in practice, right? They don't look like perfect circles. They will look elliptical um, as we approach the transition, which for this value of A is going to turn out to be at B of 3.5. So if I type in something like B of, well, right now I'm at 2. So I guess if I went just a little below 3.5, like 3.3, the prediction is I should have a pretty small limit cycle. So let's see if that's true. Possible closed orbit detected. I wonder if it has even finished integrating. If I start in here, ah, see how nasty that looks where it's all blobby? That's what I said will happen when you're near a hop bifurcation. Um, it's very slowly decaying. And, um, or is it? No, I guess that's slowly increasing, isn't it? because we still have the stable limit cycle, but it's tiny. How tiny is it? I don't know. Still thinking it's looking for a closed orbit. If I start in there, it just wants to fill up. Yeah, we're too close. Maybe I should go back to something like 3.0. Then I think I should be, have a visible limit cycle. That, yeah, well, that's pretty visible. <laughs> All right, so the, actually it shrinks fairly dramatically as you approach the bifurcation. Then if I go below, what had I shown so far? Two. So if I go to something like four, then that limit cycle will be gone. And we just have a stable point. So anyway, do use phase plane um, for your homework. I mean, I want you to be able to think analytically and do these things with geometry. But, but you can always check your results. And on harder problems, it's, it could really help back you up. All right, is there any question about anything? Um, I think I'm ready to stop early. Some people didn't correct their, didn't collect their homeworks and their tests. So come on up and do that. All right, thank you.